six. Good morning, and a warm welcome to you this morning. Oh, that sounds a bit echoey, Debbie. Can you take that down just a wee tad? Thanks very much. That's grand. Thank you. Um, good morning to all of you, and good morning especially to anybody who happens to be visiting us this morning. It's great to have you with us this morning for our second Sunday in Advent. A few thanks this morning before we begin our worship. Um, first of all, thanks to all of you who brought gifts last week. Uh, for our first Sunday in Advent gift service. Tremendous response. Um, We stopped counting at 450 gifts. Um, We think it was probably nearer 500 gifts because some of you very kindly had brought more than one gift in the gift bags that you'd provided. And I know that Women's Aid really appreciate the generosity and the kindness of people in the congregation here. So thank you so much for that. Thank you also to those who were active in the Christmas fair yesterday. It was a huge success. Um, Thanks to those who made donations, either people who have uh, made things and brought them along, or perhaps gave money donations, those who who manned the stalls, who sold stuff, those who came and bought things. Uh, A great time was had by all. And if you're on social media, then you will want to check out our Facebook page, because... The, the elves, Santa's elves yesterday were rather naughty, shall we say. Two grown-up elves, <laughs> namely Colin Weir and Andy Nielsen, uh, both of whom uh, got up to some antics during the, the morning. So if you're intrigued, go and look at the Elson Andrews Facebook page. There are a few things left over from yesterday. There are some cakes And also, there's some gifts, and there's a silent auction for an unknown gift. Even I don't know what the gift is. So, um, if you want to go through, and you're having your tea and coffee afterwards, and have a wee look at what is there, um, that would be super. Uh, Some sad news for you. Some of you will already have seen, perhaps, on the screen news, or read in your sheet, that Rita Calder, one of our older church members has passed away at Beechwood Home up in Wishaw. We don't as yet know the arrangements for Rita's funeral, unfortunately. We won't know that until at least tomorrow, uh, but it will be a single service at Holy Town Crematorium. I do know that. So, um, if you knew Rita and you'd like to attend her funeral, then hopefully we will have information through the office as the week goes on. Um, I've got a wee thing to do for the the quiz, thanks to those who supported the quiz. Um, It raised on its own £115, so we had quite a a number of donations and also uh, quite a number of submissions. So I've got them here, I'm going to pull them out, and here's the first one. So this is uh, third place. Did I get a drum roll? No? No, not a drum roll. Right, okay. This is from Hamilton. I'll not read out the address for data protection reasons because we're online. But Anne and Ian Harris. Anybody here? Anne and Ian Harris. Right, we know who they are, right? So we'll put that beside. There's a box of chocolates and also a fishing trip. (laughs) A day's fishing. Uh, That's for third place. So, well done to Anne and Ian Harris. We'll keep that there. And second place. I know you're all waiting with bated breath, aren't you? I usually get the children to do this, but the children are still practicing for the nativity. Uh, This one's Motherwell, Christine Dodd. So, that's another one that Alec will have to take care of. Nobody here to take that one. Again, some chocolates but also a day's winter sports. <laughs> Snowballs. We really have the best prizes in this church of anywhere I know. And then uh, first place, 
is this one. Let's see, who have we got? Hopefully it's somebody here this time. Oh no, <laughs> it's somebody who watches online, I happen to know, um, from Hamilton. So Ina Archibald, if you are watching online right now, and I know that you do regularly, or perhaps on catch-up, then you're about to get some chocolates, and the first prize, which is a day's astronomy. You can use your magnifying glass to look at Mars and the Milky Way. <laughs> so well done to all of those. You can give them a round of applause if you would. <laughs> Who made some submissions to our quiz. Well done indeed. And then I've got one other thing to do. Um, I need to read the edict for ordination and admission of L going to be next week. So, um, Ian Morrison and Christine Scott, members of this congregation, have been elected to be ruling elders, and the Kit Session has judged them to be qualified for that office and has sustained their election. Ian Morrison and Christine Scott have accepted office as elders. If anyone has any objections why any of these members should not be ordained or admitted to the office, they state their objection at the meeting of the Kit Session in the Lower Hall on Sunday the 11th December 2016 at 10.45. If no relevant objection regarding life or doctrine is made and substantiated, the Kit Session will proceed to the ordination and admission by order of the Kit Session, Session Clerk Crawford Moffat. Okay, there you go. My goodness, what a lot of notices and things. And there's loads more on the screen and in the sheet as well. Lots happening at this time of year. But we're here to worship God. And so I'm going to take my seat now, and the choir are going to lead us into our worship this morning. And now we're going to join our voices together with those of the choir in our opening carol. I say this every year. Some people don't particularly like this opening carol. 
but it's my favorite of all of them. O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. Each Sunday in Advent, of course, we light another candle uh, Advent crown. And last week, um, those of you who were with us would hear me say that the first candle we light is representative of the hope that Jesus brings to our world. The song that we've just sung in the refrain uses the name for Jesus, which is given before his birth even, which is the name Emmanuel which means God with us. And so, as well as coming to bring us His hope, He brings us what the second candle represents, which is His peace. Another name for Jesus in the Scriptures is the Prince of Peace. And as we light that candle for peace this morning, we recognize that there can hardly be a time in the history of our world when we have needed peace more than now. Let's share together in prayer, shall we? Two candles now burning for Advent, 
And so the level of light increases, Lord, and the darkness is pushed back again by your Holy Spirit's presence. We welcome Christ, who brings a message of hope in the face of a despairing world. We welcome Christ, who grants a sense of the peace that passes all human understanding in a society where war and violence are the order of the day. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for these precious gifts of your Spirit. As we receive them once more into our hearts, through the most precious gift of all, the Lord Jesus Christ, may we be bearers to others of light, of hope, and of peace in their time of darkness, heartache, and despair. O come, O come, Emmanuel, we sing, and we mean every word. For without your life-affirming presence and power, nothing much in this world makes sense, nor is lasting. O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. Indeed, we cry out to you, Lord, to liberate us from the things that bind us, threaten to consume us, and hold us back from becoming the people you planned that we should be. As we soften our hearts to receive your message this day, as we open our ears to hear your word of command, May we know that all our past failures are just that, in the past. And in your compassion, we pray that you will assure us of your gracious pardon, that we may live as those who are forgiven and forgiving. In the name of Christ, our Savior and eternal friend, we pray. Amen. It came upon the midnight clear, that glorious song of old, from angels bending near the earth to touch their harps of gold. Peace on the earth, good will to you from heaven's all-gracious King. The world in solemn stillness lay to hear the angels sing.
Last week, if you were with us, you'll know that we began a new, just a short series of three parts, thinking about finding God in unexpected places. We're looking at the Advent story, we're looking at the weeks and months that are leading up to the birth of Jesus Christ, and we're looking at them through the lens of Matthew's gospel. So last week we read the first 17 verses of Matthew chapter 1. It was a bit of a challenge for Helen, our BSL interpreter, who had to go through all that long list of sometimes very difficult names. And I gathered when I was speaking to Helen at the end of the service that there's not a single sign for any of those names that she'd dispel out every one. So that was an excellent job, well done. This passage from verse 18 to 25 is a wee bit more straightforward. Um, So let's read that together. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Amen. And may God bless this reading from his word. It's always a challenge to ministers like me, leading services in Advent and Christmas, to come up with something new on a traditional and ancient story. Sometimes people feel a pressure of that. I have to say to you, I don't, because I think the story is just wonderful. I think it's beautiful. I think it has a great and a rich depth to it. But there is a wee bit, I suppose, of a new highlight on it this morning. Come to that in a moment. We're going to sing together number 305, if you're following in a hymn book, In the Bleak Midwinter, and I'm hoping this is not going to be prophetic for the weather that lies ahead in the week to come.
There's always something, isn't there? Now, those of you who are following on the screens won't be aware, but those of you who are following the sheet like me are thinking, where did the, where did the third verse go? Because I just cut and paste that across from a huge file that I've got that's in CH4, which is obviously different from what we had on the screens. But hey-ho, never mind. It keeps me in my toes, that's for sure. During a trial in a small Missouri town, the local prosecuting attorney called his first witness to the stand. The witness was a well-dressed lady, and she spoke politely and was very poised in her manner. When sworn in, she was asked if she would tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Well, little did the assembled crowd know in that courtroom just how that would pan out. The prosecuting attorney, trying to curry favor with the witness, approached her and said, Mrs. Jones, do you know me? To which she responded and said, why, yes, I do know you, Mr. Williams. I've known you since you were a young boy, and frankly, you've been a big disappointment to me. You lie, you cheat on your wife, you manipulate people, you talk badly about them behind their backs, you think you're a big shot when you haven't the sense to realize you'll never amount to anything more than being a two-bit paper-pushing shyster. Yes, I know you quite well, said the witness. The lawyer was stunned and not a little flummoxed and not knowing what else to do. He pointed across the room and asked, Mrs. Jones, do you know the defense attorney? Again, she replied, why, yes, I do. I've known Mr. Bradley since he was a youngster. He's lazy, bigoted, has a bad drink problem. The man can't build or keep a normal relationship with anyone. His law practice is one of the worst in the entire state, not to mention he cheated on his wife with three different women. Yes, I know him quite well. The defense attorney almost fainted. Laughter filled the courtroom mixed with some gasps. The courtroom was in the verge of chaos. So the judge at this point thought he was going to take control. And so he brought both attorneys up to his bench. He covered over the microphone and he said in a very quiet voice to the two lawyers, if either of you morons asks her if she knows me, you will go straight to jail. <laughs> now, not a single one of us is perfect, okay? But equally, not one of us would like for the things in which we've failed to be paraded in front of a courtroom. We often disappoint ourselves we often disappoint others. Sometimes people disappoint us. They let us down. But rarely, thank the Lord, are we held up to public ridicule like these two solicitors in my story. But the Bible is actually quite plain about disappointment and about the fact that each one of us at some point in our lives is actually a disappointment, not just to our own selves, but to God who created us. And if you were listening carefully to the story that we read from Scripture this morning, then Matthew's gospel gives us a very clear instance and a super example of disappointment. There is disappointment in the Christmas story. And in particular, it's this verse, the second part of verse 18, of which I'm thinking. Matthew writes, Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. The key word here in this verse is the word before. 
before they came together, before they were Mary was pregnant. You see, you have to understand a wee bit about marriage in Jewish culture to get the significance and the weight that rested upon both Mary and Joseph's shoulders in this story. There were three stages in bringing together a man and his wife in Jewish culture. First of all, there was the arrangements. Now, this is a bit like these adverts that you hear on the radio or you see on television. In the radio, at the end of the advert, it rattles through and says, terms and conditions can be found on the website, or it lists them, or it says T's and C's. Well, there were T's and C's attached to any Jewish marriage. There was usually a dowry to be paid, for example, and there were various arrangements to be detailed between the families and agreed. But once the arrangement, the initial arrangement was made, then the couple entered a period of betrothal. It was actually a period that lasted 12 months. Now, these days, very often when young people get engaged, they can be engaged for two years, three years, five years, ten years. I've known people to be engaged considerably longer than that even. But in those days, it was expected that a 12-month waiting period ensued in this betrothal or what we would call engagement. And that was to ensure that the relationship had a sound basis on which to build for the future. So they didn't just rush into being husband and wife. And then finally came the marriage itself. After that 12-month period, the groom would leave his home to go and get his bride. They would together process through the streets of their community so that everyone could celebrate their big day with them. And then they came together in a public ceremony. And then it was back to the groom's home where it was expected that their union would be consummated. And that was the third stage. That physical expression of love was kept for when they were married and certainly was not expected to be taken on during that 12-month betrothal period. Because the purpose of that one-year period in particular was it was a period of discovery for them. They had to learn about each other and to deepen in their love for each other. But it was also particularly a time where the woman's virtue was tested. If she were faithful and a virgin, then that one-year testing period would reveal it, of course. But it was during that 12-month period, it was during that betrothal, that engagement, if you like, that Matthew records those words that I read for you. Before they came together, she was found to be with child. And that's where the disappointment comes in. Can you imagine how disappointed, how shocked Joseph must have felt? I've explained something of the culture, the background against which marriage existed in those days. The words, Mary is pregnant, must have come like a bolt of lightning out of the blue to Joseph. It would completely trash his hopes, his plans, his dreams for their future together as husband and wife. Now, let me pause there just for a moment. Because some of you, like me, have felt the weight of disappointment at one point in your life. Perhaps it's not precisely the situation before us of an unmarried teenage pregnancy 
but another set of circumstances. That disappointment brings pain that is real. That disappointment is every bit as challenging as the scenario that Joseph and Mary faced at this time. So, how do you respond when you find yourself in that place of disappointment? When disappointment literally comes and kicks down the door of your heart, where do you go with your feelings? How do you cope? Well, let's let's read on in this story. Because the Christmas story, which has Christ at its heart, has something to say to us about the way that we should deal with our disappointments. We can learn from the response of Joseph. First of all, this story focuses on the gift of the Christ or the Messiah. Messiah is just another word for Savior or Christ or anointed one. He's the Redeemer. And I think we ought to really keep that in our minds because it's, it's, it's crucial. It's really important. Jesus, we talk about so often in the church, is coming to be the Redeemer of the world. He came to redeem individual lives. He came to redeem all of our individual situations and circumstances. And so, whether it's disappointment or whatever it is, Jesus can redeem the situation. In other words, there is a way back from your disappointment. The Christmas story brings hope. The first candle that I lit last Sunday, I said, was the candle of hope. Now, that's not the kind of hope that the world has. It's not a kind of, well, I hope Motherwell are going to beat Celtic. It's not a vain and a forlorn hope. It's a hope that is based on the promises of God. And so, it's a sure and a steadfast hope. Let me read again to you verses 19 to 20 in this passage from this morning's Bible reading. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose Mary to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he considered this, An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Initially, Joseph tries to sort out this situation by himself. He thinks, on the quiet, I'll divorce her. I'll not hold her up to public ridicule. I could do it. It's well within my rights to do that. But I'll just quietly separate off from her. And then this dream comes in which he sees and hears an angel speaking. Now, the word angel, the Greek word for angel is the word angelos. And it actually just means messenger. So, a messenger from God has come to speak to Joseph about the circumstances that he faces. Talk about finding God in unexpected places. Joseph had it all planned out in his mind what he was going to do. And then God takes things in hand by sending an angel. Everything changes. The message that the angel gives to Joseph is threefold. First of all, did you notice he said, don't be afraid? I challenge you to do something over the Christmas period. Go away and look up all of the appearances of angels in the Bible, because both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, 
every time an angel appears, the angel says, don't be afraid. Why would the angel need to say, don't be afraid, if the person looked quite happy that they were there? Do you know what we think of? We think of angels as being these wee things that we put at the top of our Christmas tree. These lovely gossamer white things that are inoffensive and couldn't do anybody any harm. Clearly, angels are not like that. Angels are incredible beings who bring messages from God to His people. And the angel said, don't be afraid. There must be something about the presence of an angel that unnerves you at the very least. The angel says to Joseph, don't be afraid. And then he goes on and says, marry Mary. Take her home as your wife. Because God is at work here. This child that's growing in her is of the Holy Spirit. This is not an illicit relationship. This is not a departing from the covenant that you've entered into, the betrothal. It's okay, Joseph. Put it another way. God is saying, trust me. Trust me. Eventually. Maybe not. There it is. <laughs> he's saying, trust me. And he's saying, when it comes to Mary, do the right thing. There's somewhere. You press the next one for me, Ian? Oh, there it is. Thank you. Do the right thing. And he's also saying, the third thing, all will be well. You don't need to be afraid. Marry her. I'm at work. Trust me. Do the right thing, and everything will work out. Now, let me pause again. What is it that's caused you to feel disappointed in your life? Either right now, presently, something that's happened this week, or something that's happened maybe in the distant past, I don't know. What is it that's caused that disappointment to rise in your heart? Think about it. And know this. The Lord sees and knows your situation. He has it all under control. He knows what you're feeling. And He comes alongside you and He says, Trust me. Do the right thing. And all will be well. Because the Bible teaches us that God's got a plan for all our lives. Just as He had a plan for Mary and Joseph. He had a plan for Mary to have this special baby. He had a plan for Joseph to set aside his hurt and disappointment, his thoughts of betrayal, and to become like a foster father to baby, toddler, the young Jesus, an important role to take on. And the plan that God has for us is not just a good plan, it's the best plan of all. So what is your disappointment? Bring it to God. Then trust Him do the right thing, and He will help you to work things through. Last Sunday, we learned how God could make meaning from a mess. Do you remember that long list of names at the start of Matthew 1? And the five women that were named, and how none of the women or the men mentioned there were anything like approaching perfect. Yet out of that mess, God brought meaning. He brought a Messiah, Jesus. Well, today the message is that there is deliverance from your disappointment. But you need to put your trust in Christ. Both these messages, last week and this week, have one thing in common. 
not allowing the future to be predetermined or emasculated by the past. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, just as Joseph and Mary trusted you to lead them through some challenging times, we pray that you will help us to put our faith in your good purposes for our lives. In this moment, we bring to you our disappointments. Take from our shoulders the burdens that we feel. Free us from the power of the past and enable us to walk away from those dark moments towards your light. Help us to put our hope in the promises of Jesus and in the presence of your Holy Spirit. We will continue to worship God as we bring to Him our morning offering. And two for the price of one today, because the choir sang a lovely intro, and are now going to sing another piece as we uplift our offering.
Let's share in the prayer together as we dedicate our offering and as we remember others before God. Lord, in this season of Advent, the thoughts of many turn towards what they may receive on Christmas Day. May we who call ourselves your people buck that trend. Instead of thinking about what we can receive, may we think about what we can give. In bringing our offerings of praise and prayers, of money and of service this day, we recommit our lives to following Your will and building Your kingdom. Of course, we appreciate that this is no small thing to promise and that it will involve sacrifice. Yet, for the sake of others and the honor of Your name, we are willing to set aside self. We ask then that You will take what we give Bless and multiply it so that a harvest of good things results. And furthermore, we ask that you will please hear us as we bring before you the needs of many in our world. In line with what we've heard this morning from your word, we pray for all of those who at some level are disappointed and dissatisfied with their lot in life. It may be failure to find a job that they wish for, or success in their chosen field, or some other thing that we could not possibly know. We pray the blessing of Your holy presence might console them and reinvigorate their enthusiasm to keep on going. We intercede also for people whose life is burdened by no fault of their own, and especially we bring to you all who have been saddened by the death of a loved one in the recent air crash in South America. Please comfort the bereaved and give them hope for the future through faith in the resurrection of Christ, we pray. It's Christmas time. There will be many who are disappointed not just perhaps in the gifts they receive, but in other ways, even the ending of a relationship, of the fact that a loved one is no longer at their Christmas meal table. We know, Lord, that You are a God who loves to mend broken things. And so we pray for all who cry out to You in sincerity and in truth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Amen. Now, our final hymn this morning is a lovely, lively song. It's uh, a Christmassy, Adventy Christmassy song, but it's not a very traditional one. It's like a more modern one from the 1980s. He says it's a new one. It's almost 30 years old. Um, and we're going to do this a bit differently because the the men in the choir are going to take the lead here, so they're going to sing the, the leader's part that's marked when it comes up on the screen or on the sheet, and it rattles through fairly quickly, so just watch out for it. There's a leader's part which the men will sing in the choir. There's a part that says all, which we obviously all sing, and then there's another part in the chorus where the men and the women split up. And it's rather quick. The men sing rejoice and the women echo rejoice. So try and keep up as best you can. Um, and it'll certainly it'll get your appetite ready for your lunch. <coughs>
Arise and shine like the sun in its noonday strength. As children of the living God, reflect His glory and do His will. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of His own Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you all, now and always.